very young. And, um, so when I heard that his ensemble, Ironwood, was going to be in New York doing the bombs, I thought, this is perfect. They must come to Rochester and do this here. We're trying to stretch the boundaries of what is considered early music here. Um, so I would like to first thank um, Dr. Roger Freitas of Eastman for um, handling the Eastman side of things, coordinating all the different departments that uh, contributed to bringing Ironwood here, the um, Early Music Committee, the Musicology Department, the Departments of Strings, and the Department of Accompanying as well. So a lot of us have banded together to um, bring Ironwood here. Uh, uh, on our part, um, we were supported with a grant from the Rochester Area Community Foundation, so it's a, also a community effort as well. A couple of announcements. Tomorrow, Ironwood will give a master class at 1.30 in Chiminelli Lounge. It's open to the public as well. That lounge is in the Eastman um, Living Center, which is a little further down Gibbs Street, from 1.30 to 3.30. And after the um, performance tonight, uh, you're very welcome to come and meet the performers in the lobby out just outside. So um, about 25 years ago, I was uh, studying in London, which is where I met Neil, studying the lute, which doesn't have anything to do with Brahms, I know. Um, and I went to a summer course in Norway, very far north, in Trondheim. And that summer, we were all like, really excited about Monteverdi. We were doing all Monteverdi, all 17th century music. And one beautiful night, of course, the sun never set, and we, a bunch of us were sitting around at about 3 in the morning, and it got kind of quiet because we were sort of tired. Um, and all of a sudden, somebody said, I love Brahms. <laughs>
um, with a particular focus on the music of Brahms, in particular the Brahms violin sonatas. This style um, is really characterized by several, uh, several aspects. Firstly, a very legato bowing technique. That is a very smooth and sustained style of playing with the bow. Um, a very selective use of vibrato, that is uh, not a continuous vibrato in the modern sense of the word that we are accustomed to hearing. The vibrato itself is also very different to modern vibrato. It was a lot faster and a lot narrower. Um, portamento, that is the audible sliding from one pitch to another was also very prominent. In fact, much more prominent than vibrato as an expressive device. Um, the other factors are tempo modification that you'll hear this evening. That is, the alteration of the tempo, the speeding up or the slowing down of the overall tempo, even when it's not indicated in the score. And of course, rhythmic alteration, that is where we actually subtly alter the rhythm that's printed in the score, and this is done in several ways which we'll talk about um, in a moment. As exemplified in the recordings, uh, such features, as I mentioned, were fundamental in the playing style of Josef Joachim um, and others within and outside Brahms' circle. And they are also, of course, the focus of many contemporaneous pedagogical treatises and texts of the 19th century. Most interestingly, um, this evening, I think you may come to agree or perhaps come to ponder that this style bears little resemblance <coughs> to the accepted mainstream style in which Brahms' music is generally interpreted today. Similarly, late 19th century, or mid to late 19th century, piano playing was radically different in many ways to piano playing that we expect to hear in a concert hall today. Uh, in conjunction with written texts, early recordings, which we're going to be playing you a few of today, reveal that many pianists of Brahms' era employed all sorts of expressive devices, such as, for example, uh, separating the hands in performance, so dislocating melody from accompaniment notes, chordal arpeggiation, as well as tempo and rhythmic alterations. And they do it in a style that's completely foreign in many ways, to modern aesthetics. What's more, many of the signs that appear and the symbols that appear in the music uh, carry meanings that they no longer seem to do. Um, I'm just going to give you a shameless plug for my book, which is just about to come out, um, <laughs> published by OUP New York. It's called Off the Record, um, Forming Practices in Romantic Piano Playing. And this is actually a revision of my PhD, which I did about uh, just over 10 years ago now at Leeds University. Uh, the book explores many of, of these expressive devices and the history behind them, and also the background to uh, the meaning in written texts and, and, and how we might use them uh, in terms of interpreting what happened in the past or what the pitfalls are as well in using written texts alone. Today we're going to employ some of these expressive devices, as many as we dare to, in our performance of the Brahms F minor quintet. The extent to which such devices were applied, in other words, the places, the quality, and the quantity is the focus of our inquiry and experimentation. So we'd really like to discuss the various aspects which I've just mentioned and Neil has um, touched upon and play you some early recordings which you may not have heard before so that you might gain an appreciation of just how different the style is to modern performance practices. Um, I've also been examining, aside from the solo recordings that you may already be familiar with, um, I've also been examining um, recordings of early German string ensembles um, and other European, uh, European ensembles, quartets, particularly the Bohemian Quartet. Um, and these um, ensembles have um, a link, if you like, to uh, this 19th century performance style. Either they, uh, the members received their formative training in the 19th century, or perhaps particularly first violinists of these ensembles were either students of Joachim or closely associated with Joachim, or even uh, Brahms himself. In conjunction with written texts, uh, these recordings have led me to several conclusions concerning 
the use of vibrato in portamento. The vibrato, as I mentioned, was faster and narrower. It was often known during the 19th century as Babel. Um, and it was used very selectively to, to support and enhance crescendi, to characterize melody, or to enhance melodically or harmonically important notes. It was performed by the hand and not the arm. Its speed varied according to the intensity of the note or the placement within the phrase. So often when, the, when a phrase developed and became more intense, the vibrato might become a little faster, possibly slightly wider. Uh, on longer notes, its speed was often gradually increased throughout the duration of the notes. So the note may begin with a pure tone without any vibrato, and the vibrato was then added um, towards the end or middle of that note. Um, it was used more in music of slower rather than faster tempos, and it was also used in some instances even to give structural clarity um, to sections. And although it, it was often used during crescendos, there were many instances of uh, crescendi and climactic points where vibrato was not actually employed. So I'm going to play you a few recordings now, just um, to take you into that sound world. There is a lot of uh, what we might think of static uh, background or white noise in these recordings, and what you really have to do, at first it may seem a little overwhelming. If you can get your ears to somehow listen past that, you should be able to appreciate um, the sound on this, on these recordings, um, equally as you might on the bottom. The first recording is Joachim himself in 1903 playing his own savage romance. Many of you may have heard this. What you can hear is, again, the selective use of vibrato, often towards the end of, the ends of notes, that fast, narrow, um, and um, well, selective use.
you can hear that the use of vibrato is really quite different 